Hi all. Our second instructive game today will have the theme of weak dark squares causing nightmares. So to demonstrate this theme, I'm going to choose a game from the Women's World Championship being played in Russia at the moment. This was the first decisive strike by Kosteniak against her young Chinese opponent, Yifan Hu. So Kosteniak was playing black and played e5. After knight f3, knight c6 was played, bishop b5, the royal of Pez. Kosteniak plays quite classically now, just a6, and after bishop a4 plays knight f6. White's castled, and now she played bishop e7. After rook e1, this is all standard stuff, b5, bishop b3, castles. And an interesting first deviation from mainstream opening theory, Yufan Hu now plays a3. Slightly controversial because um, it does slightly weaken the b3 square. And as we'll see later, in the closed variations of the Brea, black often is rerouting a knight to c5. So by weakening the b3 square, it's giving the knight on c5 later a bit more influence and power. It might be an unnecessary uh, move, this a3. After d6, white now played c3. And Kostaniak now played bishop g4. So in this position, white now played d3. And Kostaniak continued now with a strategy of increasing the space on the queen's side by first playing knight a5 to liberate the c-pawn and after bishop c2 to play c5. Part of black's strategy is perhaps to discourage white from playing a later d4. So after h3, Kostaniak kept the bishop on d7 actually, he didn't retreat it to h5. If it came to h5, usually that would give white a target with this kind of manoeuvre to gain a tempo potentially on that bishop or even g4 followed by knight g3. But uh, the bishop coming back to d7 seems quite sensible in that context. White now played d4, and after queen c7, perhaps a controversial move from white, locking the center, closing it a bit more, but giving black potential use now of the c5 square. This d5 did weaken white's control of c5. Perhaps the idea was that white really didn't want black to capture with c takes d4 at some point. So uh, black now played c4, and we see now one of the problems with a3 is that this c4 seems more effective than usual to highlight the b3 square. But uh, black's knight can reroute to the center now, as we'll see. So knight b7, and after knight f1, knight c5, black is doing very well here. In fact, Ribka thinks already black has more than equalized in this position. In this position, actually, white now lashes out with g4. And we'll see now that not only is c5 a bad weak dark square for white, but potentially g5 and f4 on the other side of the board will be weak now, especially with this excellent next move by Kostaniak, which was play h5. So really provoking white into um, further concessions. If now, let's have a look, if white had played g5 as a new variation, then knight h5, h4, and here... G6 is a very good idea, I believe, with the idea of playing F6 later, which would give black a lot of options of either F takes G or F5. F takes G would give black a lot of pressure on this semi-open F file and potentially leave a weakness on G5. So white really didn't want to play G5 and played actually knight back to H2. And after HG, HG, Black now played queen c8, further provoking another weakness just to try and support that g-pawn instead of moving it forward. But um, a quick look at this moving it forward here shows that if even if white plays queen h5, it's only temporary because black is um, playing queen d8 now to immediately target that g5-pawn. And if knight f3, bishop g4, and black's a lot better. So that's the main line I'd considered if the pawn had gone forward. So actually... The pawn was supported with f3, and this gives black now a lovely strategy on the queen side, on to complement the queen side c5 outpost. Black is now aiming for for f4 and g5 posts with this move knight h7. It looks like a a, a nice um, knight retreat to support bishop g5. So after knight g3, bishop g5. Black is aiming strategically to first weaken white on these dark squares and then try and put the pieces, particularly the queen and knight, on these two squares now. So we'll see this lovely plan coming into action now. Queen d8 
Seems to leave the pawn and pre here, but that would be a terrible blunder. Let's have a quick look at that because of queen b6. And so black is now, as well as attacking the knight, fighting a discovery attack on, on white's king. So in this position, after knight f5, queen d8, white actually played king g2. And now g6 was played. Again, this knight can't take on d6. Let's have a look at that because the bishop takes, queen takes, and now queen f6. And the knight is trapped there. It would have to like sacrifice itself back on f5 with nebulous compensation. So actually, after g6, the knight just retreated humbly black back. And black's got a really great position now. White's really tied down on these dark squares. And black continues with king g7, potentially to use this h file now to try and exert more pressure on the white king side. So after rook h1, rook h8, knight h f1. Queen f6, and we see now these other dark squares are being more pressured. So bishop e3, black now seizes the opportunity to take off white's dark square bishop and play knight g5. And look at these lovely symmetrical knights on the dark squares, causing the start of white's nightmare. So after queen e2, black simply played rook a g8, a nice nifty move, perhaps giving options for the king to come to f8. But also now, after rook a f1, black played queen f4, so completely blockading that f pawn. And it's difficult to evict that queen from f4 here. The knight can't attack it from d5, and it's very difficult to arrange the knight to come to h2. So this queen is further exerting pressure on all these pawns, which are now fixed on the light squares. So white took on h8 and tried to simplify now with another rook h1. Black obliged because now there was a very powerful move from black exploiting this c5 knight. The move was knight d3 and all of a sudden this c pawn is becoming strategically significant for winning the game because after bishop takes d3 if white's played something else let's have a quick look say knight g3 then knight takes is crushing because queen takes knight e1 check for example so white decided to take that but giving black this very dangerous past d pawn and after queen f2 it was the source of now a tactical combination after d2 the queen can't take as a queen takes f3 white played knight g3 and now can you spot the next move which Kosteniak played in fact there are two strong moves here at least I'll give you five seconds starting from now the move Kosteniak played was knight takes f3 a beautiful move because after queen takes she played now bishop takes g4 and this pawn is showing how it's a very dangerous pawn going to be queened in some variations if white's not careful so white played queen f2 and the pawn queened and now black is clearly better in this endgame position so white is a clear pawn up and these pawns are coming through now on the king's side Black is even taking time to play king g8, further strengthening her position, just in case. And now e4, and white is desperately trying to create a passed pawn, but it's all too late because of this pressure on the king's side. Now f4 is threatened, so white played c5, and black just ignored c5, just played f4. And after c takes d, just took on g3, and white had, had enough. White resigned here. So let's have a look at overview and summary at this game, at how these dark squares were created, you know, these dark square weaknesses were provoked in White's position, and how the knights were skillfully used to gain a big advantage. So first, black, by playing queen c7, is tempting white to lock the center with d5, but it can sometimes be a really bad strategic mistake. And here, after c4, the knight reroutes to the center, and after g4, Black plays very energetically to make sure that the g5 and f4 squares can also be attacked and dominated. So we see now a nice bishop exchange, which is always a great preliminary in general to, to try and get control of squares of a certain colour complex. So after knight f5, queen d8, king g2, and now the knight was evicted, and we see now after king g7, the rook has a great position on h8 for attacking on the h file, and after the bishop exchanges and the knight coming to g5, all that was left was for black to further increase the pressure with queen f4. 
And now, after these rooks came off, there's the move knight d3, so creating a very powerful pawn for black, which gave rise to this very nice combination with knight takes f3. So in this combination, black is left with a clearly winning endgame position, where black's pawns are just too strong on the king side, and it led to just winning a piece now, and white resigning. I hope you enjoyed that game from the Women's World Championship, and please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.